Okay, well, I'm sure many of you recognise this view. This is the Kerrang, of course, on, on the Isle of Skye. This is the idealised Scotland, the Scotland celebrated in tourist brochures. And I stood many a time at the Kerrang and listened to people around me marvel at the view. And of course, it is a hell of a view. For most people, this landmark symbolises what Scotland looks like, what they feel Scotland should look like. And yet, this geological wonder, like so many others, for the most part, is surrounded by an ecological desert. Gone are the complex woodlands and vegetation communities that once shaped this land. Gone are many of the animals that once lived on the land. And gone, too, are many of the people who once lived from the land. Despite their unquestionable beauty and drama, many of Scotland's glens, rivers and mountains have become ecological vacuums. They lie dormant, muted, some might say dying. There's an illness that has taken hold. To, to one degree or another, we all suffer from this illness. It's a condition that has led to Scotland becoming one of the most nature depleted countries in the world in terms of the biodiversity that we've lost. It's a condition that has led us to a point where our bare river catchments are not only accepted as normal, but actually cherished and celebrated by many people, most people. It's a condition called ecological blindness. And this is a quote from a young ecologist, Gus, Gus Routledge. Many of us suffer from ecological blindness. We don't see the degraded landscapes and the animals we've lost because we're not conditioned to look. And Gus is absolutely right. Most people don't see the need to fix our landscape because they don't perceive that it's broken. There's a sort of generational amnesia that has set in whereby each new generation accepts the landscape that they're born into, irrespective of how impoverished it might be. It's said that a, a red squirrel could once travel from Lockerbie to Loch Inver without ever touching the ground. We all know instinctively that's not been possible for decades, possibly even centuries. Scotland's native pine woods have been reduced to just 84 tiny fragmented islands covering just two or three percent of their original natural range, effectively imprisoning species like red squirrels, crested tits, capercaillie, species that are dependent on forest corridors and networks. But this is not just a story <clears throat> about the loss of trees. For any living system to function, there has to be a complete community of species that work together. The plants, the insects, the micro life that provides the foundation for all life. And over time, it's that foundation, the ecological engine, if you like, that has been eroded, dismantled. Centuries of ecological decline have led to the complex living systems upon which we all depend to falter and fail. So this is where we've got to. We've lost all our large carnivores, most of our large herbivores, and if we take time to look and to, th to consider, we, we, I think we'd all admit that we spend our time desperately holding on to just fragments and threads of nature, species that were once prolific, that now teeter on the edge. So what has this all got to do with salmon? Well, for me, the answer to that starts with a quote from Dove Chadwick, a renowned wildlife biologist, who says the essence of nature is wholeness a wholeness woven from infinite complexity. Trying to save nature piece by piece doesn't make sense, even if we had all the time in the world, and we most certainly don't. And yet, it's probably fair to say that for the last 30, 40, 50 years, conservationists and land managers have been trying to save nature piece by piece. Red squirrels, corncrakes, capercaillie, water voles, wildcats, brown hares, seabirds, at one time or another, We've had a go at saving them all. And now it's the turn of Atlantic salmon. Now, I love salmon. I get their critical role completely. But if we accept that nature is that wholeness woven from infinite complexity, we can't conserve salmon in isolation. These fish are but one component in that ecological engine. And we need to fix the engine. And we need to think differently about the engine. 
And this is where ecological blindness so often takes hold. So desperate are we to save salmon or red squirrels or pine woods or whatever, speciesism sets in. We start to make judgments about those animals that are somehow more worthy of saving than others. We need to get past individual species. We need to think beyond the riverbanks. We need to see the big picture. We need to think big and bold to stretch our imaginations to what is possible and not just settle for what is easy. We need rewilding. Rewilding is an opportunity to return abundance and diversity of life to our degraded ecosystems. It's an opportunity for Scotland to lead the way in transforming its land and seas and rivers so that they work in all their colourful complexity. It's an opportunity to stitch back together an intricate tapestry of life where natural processes drive vibrant living systems. Processes like predation, scavenging, birth, death, decay, regeneration. These are the processes that drive every healthy living system on the planet. So this is an image of some autumn birch trees. Well, at least it is until you learn that just a few meters beyond these trees lies the River Feshi. And that brings context and that changes context. All of a sudden, this image becomes about ecological process. Each one of those tiny ice droplets represents a slowing of the river's flow, the passage of each droplet arrested by the tree. In a few weeks time, those leaves will drop into the water and enrich the river with nutrients. And next spring, when the leaves grow again, they'll provide food for insects, some of which will also fall into the river and provide food for fish. The roots of these birches will bind the loose glacial soil, slowing erosion and providing shelter for salmon and trout. And of course, ultimately, these trees will die and some of them will fall into the river again, creating pools for young fish. So these are much more than just trees. They're pieces of a complex ecological jigsaw, a mosaic of channels, gravel bars and wooded islands, where each piece relies on the presence of every other piece. And this brings me to a, a key sentence, I think, in this discussion, which, which due to that ecological blindness, we often forget. The health of our rivers and the life within them is directly dependent upon the health of the landscapes through which they flow. This tangled mess of birch and willow would once have been common across much of the Scottish Highlands. This woodland forms a huge carpet of carbon storing, water slowing, shade providing vegetation. This image is from Norway and this image is from Scotland. There are no, there's no tangled mess of birches in this image, no alder or willow shedding their leaves into the water, no pines binding the soils or slowing the water off the hills, no rowan or juniper or holly or honeysuckle feeding bats, birds and butterflies and fish. This is an image of ecological blindness. Most of my days are to one degree or another taking up with what is referred to as the rewilding debate and the rewilding debate is, is so often characterized by divisions and, and preconceptions. Rewilders, who, whoever they might be, are often accused of, of wanting to turn the clock back and to recreate some sort of Disney-fied wilderness, of wanting to move nature in and people out. Now I can't speak for others of course but what I can say is that for Scotland the big picture that none of that is true. For us rewilding is about uniting around shared solutions to the challenges we face not only as individuals but as a society and one of my greatest frustrations is that you know most of us all of us actually agree that a, a vibrant healthy environment is a good thing. Nobody contests that. The only thing we tend to squabble about is exactly what that looks like. But rewilding or ecological restoration or nature recovery, call it what you like, I don't particularly mind, is gathering momentum. Natural river processes are being allowed to recover in areas like Cairngorms Connect. Young forests are marching across the floodplain for the first time in generations. Rivers shaded by corridors of alder and willow are encouraged to run as they want to, as they need to. 
Glen Affric is part of another new landscape scale rewilding initiative, linking neighbouring glens in a mosaic of forest, wetland and restored peatland. And the interesting thing about these landscape scale projects is that they acknowledge that a river system is actually less of a physical entity and more a set of dynamic processes with no predetermined end point. And of course, there are a growing number of more practical river restoration projects. Many of you will recognise this, of course, this is the Rottle Burn on Angus, in Angus, where a stretch of river that was straightened 100 years ago has been re-meandered and allowed to reconnect with its floodplain. There are more trees, more flowers, more insects, more birds, and of course, more fish. This is the Pearls in Peril project in the D, and I'm, I didn't catch Lorraine's talk earlier on, but I'm sure Lorraine would have spoken about the scale of ambition that is, and scale and ambition that is now, um, in, in terms of catchment restoration, that is now evolving in the spay. And the same can be said, I'm sure, about the tweed catchment. This is Eddleston Water, of course, where re-meandering catchment ponds, leaky dams are all helping to restore natural river processes. And again, a similar story in the Calder, where riparian planting sits alongside these huge woody structures being dropped in the river to revitalise geomorphological processes. Now, I can imagine quite easily that there's a number of folk watching this talk, um, shifting a little bit uncomfortably in their chairs at being included in a talk on, on rewilding. But, you know, again, this is a, a constant source of exasperation for me. It's only a word. Let's get past the word. What unites all of these actions and many more be besides is the journey of restoration and recovery and that recognition that the health of our rivers depends on the health of the landscapes through which they flow. According to the <coughs> rewilding gospel, all species are equal. All are but one component in that ecological engine, that cogs in the mechanism of, of life. But it's also true to say that some species are more equal than others. And if ever there was an animal afflicted by our ecological blindness, it's this one. It seems really odd to me that we, we're prepared to incur the considerable cost and effort of replicating the work of beavers, yet many people remain resistant to their expansion. This is a river catchment engineer that works for free, 365 days a year, slowing the water, cleaning the water and making conditions better for dragonflies and amphibians. They love beavers. Golden eye ducks love beavers. Woodpeckers love beavers. I'm at a loss, quite frankly, to understand why anyone with an interest in dynamic, resilient river systems isn't hammering on the government's door to, uh, to enable further beaver expansion. We can't pick and choose just those animals that we like and discard the rest. But ultimately, this is not about beavers or salmon or red squirrels. It's about us. When, when people talk about rewilding, they tend to talk about habitat restoration or returning lost species. But in many ways, that's the easy bit. We know how to do the physical stuff. The challenge lies with hearts and minds. Rewilding is about overcoming ecological blindness and seeing the landscape through fresh eyes. It challenges the preconceptions that many people have about what Scotland should look like and asks instead, what could Scotland look like? So rewilding asks us all to think differently. And the key to the rewilding door rests with our thought processes, our perceptions, our values, our belief systems. And I believe it's exactly the same key to the same door when it comes to conserving salmon. 2021 marks the beginning of the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration. This is the first time there's been a global movement to restore and recover our degraded living systems rather than simply holding on to the fragments and threads of nature that we have left. And if 
Scotland is to play its part in that process, there needs to be a transformational change in the way that we perceive and relate to the landscape. And that includes rivers, of course. If people don't see a problem with the landscape, it's very difficult to ask them to change it. Rewilding is really quite a simple concept at its core. It's about working with nature instead of against it. It's about restoring abundance and diversity of life to benefit nature, to benefit climate, and crucially, to benefit people. It's about wholeness. And for it to be rolled out at the scale necessary to address the challenges that we all face, it needs the support of land managers, which, who ironically and bizarrely and mistakenly, in my view, are very often portrayed as part of the problem, when in actual fact they're an essential part of the solution. So when I mentioned the D earlier, I used two critical words, scale and ambition. We can't address exponential loss simply with incremental change. I'm not sure um, if this project has been mentioned earlier today, the Riverwoods project, um, but this is an emerging, really exciting emerging initiative funded through the Missing Salmon Alliance with scale and ambition at its core. And as the name suggests, it's predominantly about getting trees in the ground alongside rivers, but it's also about collaboration and a recognition that no single organisation or coalition of landowners can deliver scale and ambition in isolation. So it's really early days for Riverwoods, but, but I'm really excited by this because it could become a major delivery mechanism in the years to come. So that's a, a positive note to, uh, to end on and I'll, uh, I'll hand back to Pedro.